The idea of putting a spinning blade inside of a bench of some sort has been around for hundreds of years. Pre-modern mills use large spinning blades, often powered by water or wind to cut logs asunder. By the end of the 1800s, bandsaws commercially began replacing circular blades, but the blade in the bench wasn't finished yet and would one day become one of the most important tools for woodworking shops. By the beginning of the 1900s, benches equipped with circular blades would be known as tilting arbor saws, but they were still just used in the industry. As electricity began flowing into every aspect of the modern home during the 20th century, tilting arbor saws would become known as bench or table saws. The spinning blade in a table meant in the beginning to rough rip logs into materials that could be shaped with hand tools had suddenly become one of the most central tools in shops. Besides being able to rip lumber, cross-cutting stock to size with deadly accuracy had become one of the table saw's greatest strengths. Because of the versatility of table saws, we're going to look at three different sets of tips. We'll look at fine tinning, which will give us the cleanest, squarest cuts. We'll take a gander at a few jigs and a push block, as well as a few little simple hacks that I think everyone should know. Like my last full-size tip video, I've indexed each of the tips so that you can easily move on if you've already seen the tip. I've also got links you'll find in the description that go along with the video. Are you ready? There is a flame that burns inside myself. Fence alignment for table saws is absolutely critical. If the fence is out of alignment with the blade, you face kickback, burning, binding, and pinching. Even the best table saws with the greatest safety protections can't protect you from the consequences of a poorly set fence. Fortunately, checking to see if the fence is set correctly requires nothing more than your pointer finger and its sense of touch. Start off by aligning the back end of the fence to your miter slot and run your finger along the fence to see if it's coplanar to the slot. The side of the fence closest to you will give you the best indication as to whether or not your blade is parallel to the fence. If you're off even by a hair, it's time to correct it. Grab a scrap piece of wood that's the thickness of your miter slot and slide it in. All fences have set screws. Loosen them and slide the fence against the block. Check in to make sure that the back part of the fence is coplanar. Tighten the set screws. When all is done, both back and front should line up perfectly with the slot. And a bonus tip, when you measure your fence from the blade, do a double lock and measure a second time. This pulls your fence into alignment and gives you better accuracy. If you own a table saw, it more than likely came with a miter gauge. These gauges are useful, but obviously only if they're accurate. While gauges have a protractor built into them for finding and locking angles, they're not always accurate. To check for accuracy, grab a machinist square and raise the blade as high as it can go. If you don't have a machinist square, stock with a perfect 90 degree corner will work too. Set the gauge to zero degrees and add your square, moving it so that the square butts up against the blade. If it's not square, don't throw out the gauge. Loosen the locking knob and pivot the head parallel to the blade and lock it in place. Almost all miter gauges have an adjustment screw that will allow you to fine tune things. We'll move the pin so that it sits on zero and lock it down. If for some reason your gauge doesn't allow you to adjust it, add a fence to the head and slide in thin strips of aluminum to get it so that it's perfect. A pop can works perfect for this. A good final accuracy test is to make a cut, use a square to draw a line next to it, and see if it's parallel. How well do you trust this table saw bevel gauge? I rely on my table saw to be the most perfect tool in my shop. Any board I rip must have a 90 degree angle. That means like my jointer, I never question its cutting accuracy. But how accurate can we get these blades with these gauges? Do yourself a favor and do a cut flip cut test. Grab a board that is twice as wide as your throat plate, rip the board one way, flip it vertically, and run it through a second time, but only halfway. Let's look at the board now. If your second cut left a mark, your blade is not 90 degrees. To get that dead 90 degree angle, make a fresh cut and flip your board over again. Line a tooth closest to the base of your board, lock the fence, and then rotate a tooth towards the top. You'll crank the bevel gauge half the distance of the gap and you're done. This same trick can be used on any other tool that uses a blade as well as sanders. Table saw blade tear out happens at the bottom of our stock when ripping or cross cutting with a table saw. No matter how careful you are, it's going to happen. Wood is compiled of many layers of fiber stacked on top of each other. As the tooth spins, it hits the top part of the stock and chops downward, breaking each fiber layer as it rotates. I have a stack of thin strips here. If I cut halfway in and stop, you can see that it cuts neatly. But if I cut all the way through, the bottom layer isn't supported and the layer tears instead of cutting. This is how tear out occurs. The ideal way to prevent tear out is 
to add a sacrificial piece of stock below the wood we plan on cutting, but this is the most wasteful method that will end up costing you a small fortune. Using a blade that is sharp and free of residue is the best defense against this annoyance, as the fibers are more likely to cut instead of tear. But a zero clearance insert is our second best safeguard, just as the upper fibers are supported. Having an insert that the teeth fit into without any blank spaces on either side gives the very last fiber support as the tooth exits. If you're interested in a zero clearance fence that works with riving knives or easy splitters, I have a link in the description below. You need to cut extremely thin stock. Band saws aren't clean, and you want the stock to be straight. The table saw is perfect for cutting things parallel, but a thin strip of wood like this is very difficult to cut as the blade causes it to jump. The reason for this is the low mass that thin strips have which causes them to be unstable. If we want to counter this problem, we'll need to add more mass to what we're cutting. Instead, cut into a larger piece of wood, one that will allow you to safely hold it as you cut. I've set my fence so that it's 3 16ths away from the blade. With my board upright, I'll run it through. I have a thin strip jig that I use where I'll set my stock to be cut at an eighth of an inch. Now I'll cut it again. As you can see, I've made these really thin strips. The bonus is that you can flip the stock and cut it again, getting two perfect pieces, all of which is much safer than trying to cut thin stock. I have a link to this thin strip jig in the description below. It should go without saying that preserving the face of the table saw fence is a big deal. With a fence chewed out by mistaken blade cuts, it's difficult to get perfect parallel action. And as much as we try to keep the fence far away from the blade, there are, of course, times where we need to be within kissing distance of that spinning monster. To get close to the blade, add a sacrificial fence. Now there are a lot of different ways to add a sacrificial fence depending on the type of table saw fence that you have. The universal simple method is to buy a U-bolt. Measure the width of your fence and head to the hardware store. You'll want a square U-bolt, but the most important part is the threaded end. This part needs to be wider than your table saw fence. Back home, cut the U-bolt in half, drill holes in your sacrificial fence, and add the U-bolt. Add a wood washer on the other side of your fence and thread on a knob. I have more detailed instructions for this in the description below. In previous bite sizes, we've talked about using this thin strip jig to cut repeatable thin strips. If you're like me and like to make tools, this is the way to go. If you want something quicker without spending time making tools, there's a quicker way. We'll make this little jig that sits next to your blade. The one I'm gonna show you is about three inches wide, but you can make yours as wide or as narrow as you want. You'll want the length of yours to be longer than your blade. My blade is 10 inches, so I'll make mine about 11. We'll square up a piece of stock on the table saw so that when we use a square with it, it's a perfect 90. Now, we'll grab one of these thin steel rulers and cut it off at the width of our jig. Add a little epoxy or Loctite super glue and have the numbers start from zero and move away from the blade. Now to use it, it needs to be pushed up against the blade. Line your stock up, move the jig and you're good to go. We'll add a couple magnets to the top of the jig that will allow us to store it on the side of the table saw. The most dangerous place on the table saw is between the blade and the fence. This is why we use push sticks and blocks. But both of these temporary extensions of our hands are useless if you don't understand the basics of the table saw. Pushing the wood against the fence is just as important or even more important than pushing the stock forward. While riving knives and splitters can help with this, it's incredibly important to make sure you're putting emphasis on this action. Push sticks are great tools, but again, two are needed to keep the stock moving forward as well as against the fence. Because of lateral pressure, creating thin strips between the blade and the fence is incredibly difficult and can be dangerous, which is why I suggest a thin strip jig that runs on the opposite side. Push sticks can get the job done, but making contact with the blades can shatter plastic sticks and create huge kickbacks with wooden ones. While obviously not always possible, that is why I like to have at least one to two inches in this danger zone. I created this push block a few years ago that gives you a slight advantage to pushing the stock against the fence, especially when the stock moves beyond the blade. I have free step-by-steps that show you how to make this in the description below. There's nothing like a perfect square dowel. Back in number 18, we talked about how to make dowels by using old wrenches. But what about square dowels? Due to cost, these dowels have become cash erasers. Making square dowels precise isn't impossible to do without this little tip I'm going to share with you, but they can be a challenge. Here's the easiest and safest way I've found to tackle these squares with unmatched perfection. If you're making square dowels from pine construction lumber, You'll obviously need to remove the round over. We want square 90 degree edges. Next, we'll set our table saw to the width we want. The blade will need to be slightly taller than the width we set. And now we'll run it through first, being careful that we're pushing the board right up against the fence. We'll flip it and cut again. If you've done it right, you'll see your new dowel greet you. 
Making dados with a table saw is arguably the fastest way to hog out wood. It's clean, it's fast, and nearly foolproof. The most difficult part of the operation is getting the exact width of the slot you're looking for. Usually I eyeball the spinning blade next to a line I've drawn on my stock and slowly move the board in, nibbling enough to see if I'm on the line. Today we're going to make it easier by using a block of wood with perfect 90 degree corners. It might just be a single board, but I think you're going to be amazed by how powerful it is. We'll add a piece of light duty double sided tape on the edge that's not end grain. Away from the blade, we'll temporarily stick our square stock to the outside of the notch we plan on making right on our pencil line. Now we'll place it on our sled or miter gauge and use it as a reference. Extending the pencil line with a tangible edge that we can place next to the blade's teeth. Remove the simple jig and make the first cut. Now we'll slide it to the opposite side and make another cut, easily hogging out the center when we're done. Oh, and you shouldn't have to use more than a piece of carpet tape for the entire operation. On this channel, we've talked about a lot of different ways to find the height of the table saw blade. We've built this box gauge that, when pressed down, gives us an accurate reading. We've talked about this ruler gauge. If you'd like to make tools like me, these are great options. But if you're looking to cut a rebate or a dado and need a precise depth, don't grab a ruler, head to the drill press and grab a drill bit. Drill bits are machined to be nearly perfect to the size they're labeled as. They're great because they're long enough that it's not difficult to find the zenith of the blade. Besides the height, a drill bit can be used between the teeth of the blade and the fence for really narrow paths but only if you're looking again to make rebates or dados. Just remember to find the outside tooth of your blade to line the bit to as table saw teeth don't all jut out at the same distance. Oh, and also don't forget to take the drill bit off the table when you turn on the saw. See, drill bits weren't made just for drilling. Splines are some of the best ways to reinforce joints. If you're not one that likes to make jigs to make the splines, you're going to like this tip. To make a simple box or a small picture frame spline, you can make them easily with just a table saw. We'll set the blade to the thickness of the walls we are cutting for our box or picture frame multiplied by two. I have a picture frame I need to cut splines in, which is an inch wide, so I'll set my blade two inches from the surface. With the blade set, I'll slide my picture frame behind it and I'll slide the frame so that the blade is slightly below the inside corner. Now, I'll add a piece of tape on the fence to know where to stop. It's it's a good idea to use a feather board at this point, but we'll run the frame up to where we put the tape and turn off the table saw. I've got a thin strip of wood that's the thickness of my table saw blade that I'll glue and slide in. The only drawback is the slope of the round blade you use means that part of the cut you made won't be able to receive the thin strip, leaving a slight void. If you're interested in my spline jig that eliminates this problem and gives you a slightly better joint, I have a link in the description below. Despite blades being the sharpest that they can be, fiber tear out is a very natural phenomenon. As the blade exits the wood, fibers are pulled out with the blade. This occurs occurs both on the vertical and horizontal plane of the board being cut. If you're making several cuts from the same piece of lumber, with each cut you're placing the fibers of both the horizontal and vertical plane that you just cut against the fence and the table. Back in 26 we talked about keeping a sanding block on a leash when cutting. After each cut, having the sandpaper block there to clean the crusties left behind works really well, but there's another technique I rely on, especially when I don't want to stop and sand each board while the blade is spinning. After each cut, flip the stock. This will take the torn fibers and keep them from pressing up against the table as well as the fence. Besides starting a fresh 90 degree cut each time, it's also really good at giving you a good overview of each side of the stock, allowing you to adjust to errors such as knots or checks in the lumber. Thank you so much for coming along with me. Many hours are put into each one of these tips. If you enjoyed any of them, please comment and tell me which one you liked. I'd like to welcome both Gary G and Doug into my list of patrons. These two along with the others are a growing group of supporters that are helping bring these videos to life. Thank you. Michelle B, Keith Current, William L. McNally, Jerry Adams, Zach Finch, Rich Lightfoot, Tudor the Barbarian, Mike Laurinaitis, Les N, Gary G, and Doug N. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and ring that bell. And I thank you so much for being a part of my shop. Please leave a comment below. Come find me on Instagram at Make Things with Rob. And remember to keep making things. Oh